Good morning, bonjour. And I also would, would like to first thank you for the kind invitation to present my research here. Uh, it's a rather unusual context for me and I'm very happy to, to be able to, be, to speak about Islamic law and Islamic culture in regions that are usually presented as rather peripheral. So I will talk mainly about the practice of Islamic law regarding to work in the Sahara, in the Saharan region, that is southern Algeria, Mauritania, Mali and Niger. Niger. And of course, I, I, these are regions that are now a bit more known for unfortunately very sad reasons but I think I will maybe to make things a, a bit more more or less abstract I will I will mainly talk about a tradition that is today somehow symbolized by what is what is called the famous manuscripts of Timbuktu so the kind of text I work on are those that are uh, preser preserved in the li in private libraries like those of Timbuktu. So this is just to say that what is usually referred to as the manuscripts of Timbuktu is not something unique to Timbuktu, but represents a, la a larger regional tradition of Islamic scholarship in the whole regions that emerged uh, since the 15th and the 16th century. So this is just uh, for as, as an introduction, but I think more sociologically or anthropologically speaking, the question that I want to discuss with, by taking the example of Waqf is how cohesive political and normative structures emerge within societies that are highly literate but largely deprived of centralizing state agencies. So this is some maybe one of the main questions of my own research. And I think that rural societies in the pre-modern Muslim world are particularly appropriate to discuss this problem. Since the introduction of Islam in these societies almost inevitably entails the spread of both forms of literacy and legal normativity. So if we take the example of early modern North and West Africa, on which my research focuses, we see indeed that especially in rural settings, the social life of many Muslim communities was often characterized by weak go governmental structures, but sophisticated religious institutions, which diffused Islamic literacy and law on a very large scale. In other words, the development since the 15th century of a dense network of institutions of Islamic learning that is the Zawiya in the North African context, controlled by saintly and scholarly lineages, was concomitant to the establishment of two main institutions of normative regulation, the Qadi's Court and notarial certification. I am conscious that this vision runs against the grain of still prevalent interpretations that see Islamic law and literacy as an essentially urban phenomenon which had little impact on rural context, where different types of customary law are supposed to have regulated most forms of social interaction. However, especially in the case of the Saharan region, recent scholarship has amply demonstrated the importance of Islam and its normative and literate traditions as an institutionalizing agent in regions facing the absence of state authority. And I, I would like to stress that I'm not transposing here with regard to this concept of stateless societies an European model to other contexts. So we take, because you may, you, may, you may say that talking about stateless society makes no sense because we are rather transposing the, the, new, no, the, the notion of state to non-European context. But I think that this absence of a legal, of a legitimate political ruler, that is in the Islamic tradition, the Imam, was something uh, that was reflected on by local Saharan scholars and that is incorporated in the, in the doctrine of the Bilat al-Sa'iba. So 
you know maybe in, in the colonial period this notion of Bilad Siba in dialect was presented as something characteristic to the Maghreb, to the Morocco, that mainly Morocco, that distinguished between regions that are under the control of the Moroccan Sultan and regions that are tribal regions. But in fact, the problem it, it's a much larger problem that was debated by, at, at least in the Maliki school, by jurists from the at least uh, from the 11th century onwards. So this is what, what, how political structures must be in regions that are under, not under the control of a, of a, of a legitimate ruler. So to, to go back to the Sahara, there were some Saharan con um, scholars, like uh, a Mauritanian scholar, Mohammed Al-Mami, uh, who lived in the 19th century, presented his region, Maurit modern Mauritania, as, as a sort of intermediary region between the Moroccan Empire and, the, and at that time in the 19th century, the Islamic states of, of the Saharan zone in, in West Africa. So he called it the Barzakh. So you see the the intermediate zone. In, the, in, in those regions, the cultural resources of Islam, based on the written word, furnished the raw materials to create an institutional, uh, institutional and normative framework that ensured at least a minimum of stability in economic and social exchange. And I'm referring here mainly to the pioneering study by, uh, by Gilan Leiden, on, on, who is a prof associate professor at UCLA on, on trans-Saharan trade networks in the 19th century, mainly between uh, southern Morocco, the wet, wet noon region, and, and Senegal. And she, in, this, in her study, she, she, she developed the notion of uh, the conception of Islamic scholars, or jurists, mainly jurists and, 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 and magistrates, as legal service providers. And I, I just quote, she writes, Muslim legal service providers who engage in jurisprudence use their knowledge emanating from the Quran, other sources of Islamic law, legal doctrine, and customary law to provide a semblance of social and economic order. In addition to upholding the law, legal experts also def define terms of trade, clarify standard evaluations and, equi and equivalence equivalencies and negotiated behavioral norms, including the commercial practices of merchants and traders. So in a way, Islamic scholarship somehow replaced state institutions to a certain degree, of course. Indeed, I think too that the, a major consequence of the massive diffusion of Islamic liter literacy in rural areas in North and West Africa between the 15th and the 19th centuries was the spread of Islamic legal instruments and institutions among lo local crop groupings, both sedentary and nomadic. So there is, in, in several nomadic tribes in Mauritania, you have a very strong tradition of legal scholarship. And it's very interesting that you find in, in, in 17th, 18th century Mauritania, tribal nomadic confederations that have also the institution of qadis and muftis and you see there is a even in this context there is a clear tendency to reproduce islamic normative and legal structures so through this process the sharia or the shar though this is the islamic normativity becomes became the the centerpiece of societal discourse to paraphrase um, the american anthropologist prinkley messick who worked mainly on on yemen this is to say that the presence of legal institutions generated new patterns of cultural and social interaction such as qadi court litigation the generalization of notarial certification or the practice of juridical consultation, ifta, so muftis um, um, issuing fatwas. Or, to put it differently, through the spread of Islamic literacy, a new normative order emerged that reconfigured the relationship not only between sharia and forms of customary law, but also between orality and the written word. Because any practice of Islamic law, at least in its classical forms, somehow entails the use of, uh, yeah, of the written word, of texts, 
So I'm here alluding to the to Jack Goody and his uh, anthropology on, on the on the importance of of the introduction of uh, of of writing. So grounded in post -class post classical Malikism, it the spread of Islamic literacy promoted literate forms of social communication as well as techniques and institutions of conflict management that had hitherto been limited to urban contexts. So for example you see in, in, in one in some regions that uh, village communities introduce the institution of the shura, that is the consultative council, which is very famous in the medieval Andalusian tradition. So they, for example, in a, in a, in a, town, in a, in a city like Cordoba, you have the main qadi, the uh, qadi al-jama'ah, who, who, who before issuing uh, rulings consults with, with legal experts, the muftis, assembled in this uh, council, the shura. And this kind of institutions you will find also in the Saharan context from the say, 17th, 18th, in, in the 17th, 18th century. So my, one might, might now ask, what's the place of the habbus or the waqf? In, in, in the Malik context, we all mostly say habbus. And what's the place of the habbus in all this? I will say that among the legal instruments that were diffused through the network of Islamic learning r institutions, the habus might be seen, or is, by far the most important and most frequently used. The massive expansion of notarily, notarial writing observable in the Maghrib and the Sahara since the 15th and 16th century amply, amply attests a widespread diffusion of habus creations in various social contexts. So this is something almost already Jacques Berg in his studies of, of the of the, of the Berbers of the High Atlas alluded to. That is something you 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 you, you that the how the, the how to say that that becomes very um, evident from the from the sixteenth century onwards because there are a lot of local of collections of legal documents pertaining to, to work foundations. The, all these rural uh, habus have, n have, have until now st been studied almost entirely by anthropologists and not so much by historians, um, at least to my, to my knowledge. So, for example, there's one uh, French um, anthropologist, Geneviève Bedoucha, who worked on, the, on southern Tunisia. And, then, and in her study, she focused on the importance of these documents, work documents, in, in contemporary lineage struggles. This is to say that a history of the rural hubs institutions that engages in a long-term analysis still remains to be written. And today I would like to make a modest contribution to this history of the, of the Habus institutions in, 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 in rural context by focusing on the question how the Habus were integrated into structures of community organizations and how uh, com community organization and how communities dealt with the problems arising from rural Habus administration. The examples I will present are taken from legal documents dating from mainly from the 18th century and coming from the oasis of Tuat in present-day southern Algeria. So on the map you see the, maybe you see the town of Adrach, you see, and Regan, so it's really in the middle of the Algerian Sahara. So this is the, the region of the oasis of Tuat, so it's a region composed of several oases that is somehow in a way mark the, constitute the frontier between what I would call the North Africa or the Maghribi Sahara and the Sahelian zone. So they, it's about 1,000 kilometers or 600 kilometers in the south from Oran and six, also 500 kilometers or 1,000, no, no more, uh, 700 kilometers to Timbuktu. So it's really like a, like a how to say, a, <laughs> my English. <laughs> so it's a, car a carrefour. <laughs> Pardon. <laughs> but you see the point. So this is really some f a, a region situated between sub-Saharan Africa and, and crossroads. Why? 
That's the word. Excuse <laughs> me. So this region emerges from, sixth, uh, from, from the 6th to 15th century as a major center of Islamic learning traditions in the Sahara. And especially from the 17th, 18th centuries onwards, we have the, de the development of very important local literary traditions that are ma ma mostly linked to legal scholarship. So for example, my, own, my PhD thesis was about to, to reconstruct how Islamic uh, justice or the Qadi institutions functioned in this region. And I based, based my analysis on the, uh, on the, uh, uh, on the ex exploration of several corpuses of jurisprudence of fatwa collections, which is called in, in Arabic Nawazil and which were com um, assembled in the, in the region between six, um, 70, oh, excuse me, uh, 1750 and 1850. So in, in, and these collections contain consultations uh, issued by different uh, legal, legal scholars of the regions, and also, but also can include the transcriptions of Qadi's decisions. So, just to give you some, so this is one, some pictures of the, the Trat region. So it's a region composed by villages and, uh, and agriculture based on the de de date, cr uh, that date grows. So I want this. So this is this kind of um, manuscript I worked with. So you, now what, for example, this is um, an excerpt from an, uh, from the from a from a uh, now was a collection of the uh, from the 18th century, written by a, by a local scholar, and, and it contains. You see, this the chapter on on jurisdiction. Jurisdiction. Now was al qada wa shahada wa matalaka biha, and on the, on the basis of this liter legal literature, I was able, or you are, or it is possible to reconstruct how legal and normative, Islamic normative institutions worked and mostly how they interacted with local populations. I should add that some, I, feel I will make some, also some remarks on the, on the political structures of the, of the region. So formally, the Tuat is under Moroccan sovereignty since, since the 16th century. And this caused in the 19th century several problems when, when, when France tried to, started to expand towards the southern Sahara because the region officially was part of the Moroccan Empire. And until now, it, it's, a very, it's a contested region between Morocco and Algeria, which some, sometimes complicates research, doing research in the region, because legal at, all re legal documents, in a way, attest that the region was part of Morocco. And of course, this is very sensible in the, in the, in the actual political context. But, and this is the important point, this Moroccan sovereignty exerted on, on the Tuat region was rather, was rather formal. That is, it, it, it consisted mostly on, on, on the prele um, that, the, that the Moroccan Mahsen or the Moroccan said sent uh, expeditions every five years in order to collect taxes and that it nominated some Qadis in the region. But these Qadis were not sent by the Moroccan Sultan, but are members of local scholarly lineages that were in a way confirmed in their functions by the Moroccan uh, state. So this is to say that, that the Tuat region was, was an autonomous region that did not was not really integrated in a centralizing state uh, apparatus. So the political structures in the region at that time were marked by an oligarchic regime that was controlled by two main actors, what I call secular notables and religious scholars and saints. So this is also just one point. I think that the distinction between scholars and saints is not very useful for the Sarah in, in the Saharan context. There's a lot of things to say, but just to put things shortly, at that time in the 18th century, there was not a real, how to say, a contradiction between being 
a saint and being a scholar. Mostly these things were together. So someone could be a Qadi and at the same time uh, initiate people to Sufism, etc. Just a brief remark. So, but to make, to, just to, 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 but to indicate that both kinds of s religious behavior were present in the region, I, I use the term scholars and saints, but most often these are the same persons. So what I consider secular notables, I, there I refer to 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 mar merchants and members of most of them, or um, or, or land owning or uh, a land owning elite that had no that had no particular religious prestige, based on learning or, or sainted, saintness sainthood. But what is important here to in the case of Tua to underline is that these notables are most often members of Shurfa lineages. So Shurfa, this means that is, uh, these are families that, re, uh, that um, vindicate to, uh, to um, the de descendre, the to, uh, to be linked to the Prophet. Um, and most often, normally in, 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 in North African studies, even these, crew, these groups are, are presented as part of, of the religious establishment. But what's very interesting in the legal documents from Tuat and other Saharan regions is that they somehow show a much more secular profile. For example, most of them are slave traders, engage in tribal warfare, so they are not really like uh, like like in in, in northern context. They are not peacemaking, neutral mediators to 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 use uh, to some terms from from social anthropology from the social anthropology tradition. So the secular notables in the Tuat region, most of them are Shurfas, and they ha do not prof um, present the profile of religious scholars. So these. Both groups of, um, of social elites concurred to create a normative, a cohesive normative framework for social interaction that focused on, on several points of um, way we, where we can dis distinguish several domains of, of intervention. That is, first of all, of course, litigation and public order. So that is. The, the, the Cardi courts and, and any other forms of, uh, ex of, of making justice. Then the control of natural resources and ag agricultural infrastructures with regard to water, to, to the irrigation system based on, on subterranean water galleries, the Fugara, and the disposition of land, land plots and palm groves. Finally, the then the administration of communal institutions, mainly the mosque and the Quran school, the Kutab, and also the, the, anima uh, the, the organization of a kind of public reg reg register with regard to, to, to land, uh, land property and also water property, because in the region water is owned. It's also, um, it's a, it can be uh, subject to private property. Finally, we have the organization of a collective policy with regard to external threats. That is mainly the, the tributes uh, demanded by, by no, nomadic tribes uh, who make, exert a, a strong pressure on these um, Oasian uh, villages and also with regard to the Mahs, to the Moroccan Mahsin, who uh, when it comes to, when, they, when, when he sends its, when it sends its troops to Le Levi, Texas. Don't How to, in order to organize all these different tasks, Diff uh, several institutional roles were distributed among the members of this oligarchy and, in, in, and this can be reconstructed from the legal sources. So on the one hand we have the protagonists of Islamic justice, the Qadi and the Mufti. Both functions are assumed by, of course, by the members of the different scholarly and saintly lineages. And here also I, I would like to insist that the term Qadi and Mufti refers to functions. It does not refer to, to persons or personalities. This is to say that a Qadi can at the same time be act as a Mufti, and a Mufti by times can act as a Qadi. Sometimes this is not, 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 not clear. 
So this, uh, these are the protagonists of, the, of Islamic justice. On the other hand, you have secular notables that appear most often as a collecti collectivity, as the village assembly, the uh, Jama'at al ayyan that is the, yeah, the, the, the village council was the main institution in organizing um, the uh, public order, etc. But also as, as individuals, these secular notables appear through two main institutional roles, as witnesses, notaries, as shuhud, and as legal experts, araf. I will come to that later in the, in the different examples I will present. But just to say that these, this is the institutional framework in which the, the administration of waqf takes place. So, as a legal instrument and as a social institution, the habus is of course omnipresent in 18th century Tuat. Because, first of all, most landed property is under habus regime. And as such, it, it constitutes, and, and we are here in an agricultural society, so owning land and managing land property is the most important part of, of normative uh, activity. So for example, in the, in the most important um, collection of, of fatwas from Swat, which uh, that is the corpus called the Runya, dates from the beginning of the 19th century, the chapter dealing with habus pro habs or waqf problems is by far the most voluminous and contains more than 100 folios tightly written. So this is an example of the, of the runia. And this frequency of cases documented in the Nawazil reflects the importance of the hubs in local property practices and the exploitation of agricultural resources. And with regard to Twat, we have to, but with regard to the Habus, we have to think, distinguish between three types. We have, on the one hand, first we have, of course, as in any rural uh, context uh, in North Africa, what, what is sometimes called private Habs, Waqf or Habus Ahli. That is, <coughs> that normally these, ha these Waqf are used in order to circumvent the, the, the inheritance rules um, defined by the, by, the, by the Sharia. So this is no, normally in these, in these agricultural uh, societies, it's a way in order to avoid that property will be, uh, will we, uh, how to say, will be, fragmented. Fra fra will be fragmented, yes, thanks. But I, and, and also it's, it is normally presented as a mean in order to, uh, uh, to avoid that women obtain their share inheritance. But what I want to, to stress is that, that these, this is only one possible use of the waqf or of habus. Um, uh, I saw from the documents I analyzed that, that also hub, the habs was used in order to, to guarantee uh, uh, to women their share in inheritance. So it's, it's a m very complex question. So this is the first most important type of waqf in the region. Then you have the, the habus or the waqf belonging to local or external zawiyas, belong to the Islamic le the, what these Islamic learning centers or um, or saintly or or, or, or belongings to, um, to to saintly lineages. And here also I said local and in is external. That is, of course, you have the local um, Islamic learning centers that have a lot of, uh, of work property, but you have also ex external uh, Zawiya situated in Morocco, no, most of, uh, mostly the, the Zawiya of Wazan, who own, who own Waqf in the region. Just to say this is a very complex uh, um, uh, situation. And then finally, you have the habus, which serve to maintain communal institutions, primarily mosques and Quranic schools, but also um, works dedicated in order to finance the tribute uh, for, uh, um, given to, to nomadic tribes. And it should be noted that the habus pertaining to zawiyas are situated at an intermediary level between private and public hab habus. 
because, and the, because of the different forms of evolution the institution might take. So this is, f if you have, for example, a zawiya, at the, normally a zawiya is linked to a scholarly family. Of course, the transmission of knowledge and also the transmission of sainthood is not an automatic process. It depends on, on individuals, on their charism and on their knowledge skills. So there is there are tendency if in, in later generations the Zawiya does not or the lineage does not continue its scholarly or saintly activities. So then the habus becomes uh, more or less uh, a sort, source of revenue for the family and it does not assume any public functions anymore. On the other hand, you have zawiyas that present themselves as, 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 a, as a kind of public institutions around which the community organizes itself you know, through teaching activities, through the, the organization of collectors' religious rituals, etc. So this is to say that I, in al always if you have a kind of institution, its shape depends always also on the, on the practices and uses attached to this institution. So the Zawiya, there is no, there's not one, one unique profile, but it can change. So. And it is somehow situated between private administration or of, of property and public ad administration of property. Finally, habits do not only concern landed property, but also real estate, movable objects, slaves, and most important, shares in the Fogara irrigation system. Like in urban contexts, the Qadi is the main institutional actor with regard to the administration of habits. His decisions are supported and executed by the Jama'a, by this institutional council, by this, um, excuse me, by this, by this, by the village council that assembles the different notables. So this is also a very important point because mostly in, in North African studies, the Jama'a is presented as something essential to Berber society. Also. And here you see that the Jama'a appears as an Islamic institution. And there's also, there might, may, maybe I, sh I will just, just allude to it, there is among the local jurist consuls uh, a strong debate in order to legitimate in Islamic terms so the power asserted by, by the Jama'a ah as, le as the legal representant of the Sultan or of the Imam, of the Sovereign, in, in, uh, in his absence. That means that the, uh, it's, it's not very clear, excuse me, um, the Jama'a, ah, the, the local jurisprudence councils present the Jama'a ah as the only institution that has the right to replace the, the missing or state structures in a way. It takes the place of the, um, of the, of the, of the, of the, of the Sultan. Man qama bi maqam al-imam fi ghiyabihi in Arabic, that's the, the term. So the Jama'a appears as the main institutional partner of Islamic justice. So this is the point to, to keep in mind. In the absence, even in the absence of a Qadi institution, so for some villages there is no Qadi, the Jewish consuls, no, there was first the practice, there was the practice that the Jama'a ah take, took its pl his place, so assumed the main prerogatives as the Qadi. And this practice was also legitimized by the local jurists with the same argument that normally if there is no Qadi, if there is no Sultan, then the Jama'a ah takes it place, it takes uh, their place. So the argument is the Jama'a ah in Arabic, that means the community of the faithful. So they, they uh, how to say, they manipulate the, the, the meaning of, of words. And of course, it means, concrete, in, in concrete terms, it means the institution of the village council. So just to say that these things cannot be presented only as customary institutions. However, according to the sources of my disposal, only the Qadi, the judges, seem to have exerted the right to formally dissolve a Habs endowment. It's in, Aram, uh, in Arabic it's called Qasar al-Habs. And such, such dissolution actually took place and they 
could occur for various reasons. Mostly they resulted from contestations taken before the Cadiz court. So most often inheritance conflicts. So as I said, the habus was used in order to prevent the fragmentation of property. Then of course those who, who had an interest in, in, in that, that the um, that, uh, land, landed plots were put into the, into the, uh, the market. They tried to find a uh, vis de form. Uh, um, what's it? It's called. Um, uh, they find ah, what's it called with the phone. Or they f they try to find some what's it called missing er errors in the in the in the inst in the formal institution of the creation of the habus, in order to attack the habus and to say it's not valid because it was not made according the legal rules of the Maliki school. For example, we have a whole debate. One deba one principal argument that appears always in this kind of litigation is that there was no hiyaza that the people did not take, uh, um, did not appropriate the, 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 haq, the waqf. Because if you, in, in Islamic law, if you uh, create a, haq, a waqf, then you must not only detach yourself from this property, and all the, you, the other part, the beneficiaries, all have to take it and to start to use it. And often, because these kind of works were, were in a way ficti fictional or fictitious, so this kind of action, of course, did not uh, take place because people continued to use the work. It was only a, a device in order to, 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 pr to uh, circumvent the legal rules of inheritance. So in, in court uh, litigations, the argument was often raised that actually these people did not use the work for, and etc. You see the, the point. So this just to make, and this could actually lead to the um, to the dissolution, dissolution of the waqf. Another case where open debts and other and forms or general forms of competition over land expansion. But what is important here for our point is that these con dissolutions also could concern public and semi-public habus belonging to zawiyas. So I came across a case uh, where uh, there we are uh, situated in the south of Tuat, in uh, Regan. So Regan, you see on the, on the map, there in the south, there's a very important Zawiya in Regan. To, uh, uh, till today, uh, that exists till today, main uh, religious functions in the region. And several of their habus were Dissoluted by by local cadis because this area had um, had open debts that they did not pay back. So the cadi ordered and uh, the the dissolution of waqf uh, in uh, in order because the arg the legal argument was to say that this habs uh, this habs was created uh, with, uh, with 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 funds that were actually not owned by the by the beneficiaries of this area. So we cannot create a hubs with, with, with um, how to say, with funding that, that you owe to someone, own to someone. <laughs> what is however more important to our, for our discussion here are the ways how the Muslim magistrates and community councils endeavored to ensure the preservation of the profitability of both private and public hubs. So one example for this is the procedure of the mu'awada. And mu'awada is a, what, what means that if a waqf does not produce any longer important revenues, you may, but in the case of the of, of, of Saharan Oasis uh, society, this may mostly of, because of this this desiccation, because there is not enough water anymore in order to, to cultivate the plot. So then you may transfer the, the waqf to another garden. And it's very interesting. So this, this was something that has always, always already been observed in urban context. There is an Israeli uh, historian, uh, Tal Shual, who worked on Algiers in the Ottoman period. And he showed that if, uh, if um, real estate loses its pros pro, um, profitability, 
the waqf attached to it can be transferred to another uh, object that has the main value. And uh, what's interesting is that Tal Shual in her, in, in her study presents these things as, as something that could not be made mit, mit, with Maliki law. So people resorted to Hanafi law in order to, 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 to realize these procedures. What I see in Tuat is that, because Tuat is a, is a Maliki region, it did not belong to the Ottoman Empire, not even formally, so the only, practice, the only law practice is Maliki law. And the Mu'awada appears as a very important institution. So I have no, co no uh, real uh, answer to this. Um, I, w I, I, I will not say that Taj Wal is wrong, I don't know, but I only saw in my documents that they practice the Mu'awada. That needs to be further investigated, I think. But of course I see also that it is a very sensible process, procedure because it entails a very strong risk of rarar, of riba, that they, uh, how to translate in English, uh, of uh, interest. It's okay. <laughs> but you see, because the, the, that there are many. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, and as such, it involved all institutional actors of the community. So this is a, as a, as a, it, it's a procedure that engages the whole community in a way, at least institutionally. That is, first of all, it has to be authorized by the Qadi. No, it is first and, and discussed and envisioned as a possibility in order to preserve the, 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 the waqf within the council of the Jama'a. The Jama'a then addresses itself to the Qadi, who has to legitimize it, because, as I said, it's a very sensible procedure for legal reasons. And then the Qadi will charge the legal experts, the Araf, and the witnesses, the Shuhud, to execute the procedure. And I, re I, I, I remind that the Araf and the Shuhud are members of the community council. So that is, the Araf will evaluate the value of the Habus, all of these things and on, of the new land plot, that will be, uh, of the different land plot that will be exchanged, and the Shuhud will transcribe it, transcribe it as, as notaries, and then, most often, in order pro to protect the procedure, they will um, contact a mufti for to, to issue a fatwa that will legitimate the transfer, the transfer. So you see that this kind of procedure takes place within the local community, and it mobilizes different form, different kinds of institutional actors that are both uh, linked to, to community structures and to Islamic legal structures. These procedures have to be seen in the context of the pre 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 preciousness and also the precariousness of ag agricultural resources and infrastructures in the Sahara because of the climate conditions, of course. Any form of agricultural activity is precarious. We learned, for example, in one legal consultation that comes also from the from the uh, uh, from the Runia compilation from this compilation that that in one that once a legal consultation demand istifta in Arabic was addressed to a local kaf, ka, uh, mufti or local jurisconsult concerning a case where in a village heavy winds threatened the, the, a palm grove under Habs regime whose be be beneficiaries had em emigrated. The Jama'a, the, uh, that is the, the com um, community council, thus decided to sell the Habs in order to prevent further damages. And the Qadi authorized the procedure. In other words, private rights were put aside for consideration of public good. Because it was esteemed as more important in order to, to keep um, agricultural surface than to respect the rights uh, of people who, are, uh, who were absent. 
this also leads um, just uh, by the way this also um, uh, highlights a, a, a frequent problem in these saharan societies where many people uh, emigrate to travel for for business reason for any kind of right, doing uh, or, or also for study reason. So there is always a, a, a great part of the local population that is not present. But of course that preserves its rights with regard to heritage, with, with in inheritance, with regard to the to wax revenues. But in this case, the, the, the problem, the, 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 the threat of, uh, of danger, of damage, of barar, in a way, neutralizes their, their rights uh, on, 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 on the wax. Of course, for local juris consuls, such, such decisions were, hi were highly controversial, controversial since Islamic law puts a high value on the protection of in individual property. So this is also not to say that these kind of arrangements took place without tension. They were heavily debated, but there is a clear tendency within the, the legal sources that most often the doctrine of the community good um, was had more had a stronger impact on, on actual practices than, con than uh, theoretical considerations concerning uh, private property. And most often, community cal uh, decisions concerning the 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 um, dissol dissolution of waqf were endorsed by muftis and qadis. In the Runya, also in this um, compilation, we find a case where the Jama'a of, of a village called Al Barka makes a request to its local jurist concerning a Zawiya in the that is situated in the village whose administrators neglect both the maintain of the hubs attached to the Zawiya and its public charitable functions, such as offering hospitality to people in need and to participate in the payment of tributes to the nomads and the Mahsen, it's called Mudarat. They accuse indeed the administrators, the, the administrators to disrespect the initial stipulations of the Muhabbas, that is the Habas founder. And inter interestingly, the defending party, party reverses the argument by claiming that they do not dispose of the necessary material means to, to, to assure, ensure the, um, the public functions of the Zawiya, and it, it should be the Jama'a that, should, that in a way should support the activities of the Zawiya and the preservation of the waqf attached to it. This shows all. This leads. This example allows me to to point another problem linked to the community structures, because on the one hand you see this what I alre al already explained that the jama'a tries to keep community structures in in life and to preserve it, and that it even attacks private interests in order to to en ensure these public functions. On the other hand, you see that the individuals do not, in, that this also has nothing of an at autonomic, automatic process. And this, that the, the actions of the social elites uh, through the institution of the Jama'a encounter strong resistance, resistance by individuals and, 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 and local interest groups. In this case, I presented the, the ruling of the Qadi was in favor of the Jama'a, which shows also that there was a, which shows that uh, that most that in, in general the ju jurist councils try to endorse the actions of the Jama'a, as, as I already had told. But in other cases, we see that indeed the Muslim jurists endorsed or uh, uh, accepted the claims by individuals against the wills of the co collectivity. Which, so we see that the practice, legal practice or the link to the to waqf and also to other institutions is embedded in a, in a very in a sort of competitive um, climate that opposes 
frequently individual interests and community structures. Another is illustration of this classical sociological problem of the antagonism between individual and group interests are the frequent conflicts between the Imam of the village mosque and the Jama'a, which pays his salary from the revenue of the hubs attached to the mosque. So because mo this is most of the Imams leading prayer in the, in the mosque are not members of the relig local religious elites, but are more or less marginal figures, most often foreigners, that are en engaged by the Jama'a on a contractual basis and they perceive a salary coming from the, uh, from the work foundations. And very often we see that, that, <laughs> that this creates problems because sometimes uh, since these people are not really members of the communities, they have no very strong links to the community, very often they want to leave before the end of their contract. So the Shama will seek the Qadi court in order to avoid this or will ask the, uh, the Imam to, to um, rembourser, to, to, to pay back the salary perceived from the, from, the, from the waqf. So this also is, is an example that shows that the individual and the community <laughs> do not always get along with each other. And I think that these kind of conflicts are ex ex exacerbated by the absence of central political power capable to, uh, uh, that is able to impose its decisions. This is not to say that the Jama'a was deprived of coercive means, but that these means nevertheless depended always on broad consensus within the member, with, among the members of, among its members. Because any member of the, of the Jama'a represents also a lineage, a family. So he's also a sort of, he has also his own individual interests and also the interests of his group. And all the, which makes that, that the process, process of decision taking within these community structures are, could be easily manipulated. In other words, all kinds of normative decisions had to be negotiated and therefore were always potentially open to contestation. So this is something that emerges very clearly from the legal um, uh, sources. Yet, and this might um, open our discussion, it must be stressed that all such negotiation and contestation takes place within a normative and institutional framework that emerged from a constant interaction between Islamic legal thought and local contexts. This means, with reference to John Komarov and Simon Roberts' classic study rules and process, that any local form of normative action, such as the establishment, as, such as establishing a hubs, as well as any competitive claim that might result from it, is expressed within the legal system of the fiqh, which thereby contributes significantly to shape, to shape social relations on the ground. And this independently of any state intervention. It thus shows that the imposition of a legal order through consensual mechanism cannot be reduced to a question pertaining to the study of custom law, that it, but that it can also be addressed with regard to the practice of Islamic law. Thanks.